Well, good morning, church. Come on, guys. Good morning, church. There we go. <laughs> I love it. And a special welcome to those of you that are watching online this morning. Always so great to have those of you joining us virtually. Well, today we are going to be wrapping up our series on the book of Proverbs. And man, what an incredible blessing this series has been, at least to me personally, right, to hear such biblical, practical wisdom, right? In a world that's so filled with so many opinions, right? You don't have to look very far to hear somebody's opinion. It's been such a blessing to just to receive some biblical, godly wisdom. Amen? Amen. All right. Well, this morning, I'm especially excited because I get to preach on one of my favorite topics. Now, this topic, if you look throughout Proverbs, it's sprinkled almost in every chapter. And I'm talking about the topic of generosity. And one of the reasons I love talking about generosity so much is that when God reveals the power of generosity in our lives, it has the ability to change our lives. If we'll let him, he will change our lives through generosity. So I'm so excited to bring this message today because I have hope to see that change in the lives of some of you this morning. Right? Generosity has a, the ability to bring you joy in even the hardest of situations. I've seen this firsthand as I've gotten to travel all around the world to some of the poorest parts of the world, and I've seen this joy that you would never expect in the hearts of those you would least expect it, right? Some of the poorest people in the world have some of the most joy because they understand this gift of generosity, this gift of generosity that doesn't, says it doesn't matter how much you give or how much you have, but how much you give that brings you joy. But somehow, for those of us in America, we seem to have missed this point, right? Or honestly, we probably haven't missed it, especially those of us who are in church, probably ignored it because the Bible talks about generosity a lot, y'all. The Bible talks about generosity so much. In fact, as I was preparing for this message, I went and I, I, I found some research that showed how many times certain topics, certain words are talked about in the Bible, right? And there were some that weren't surprising to me at all, right? The word prayer. You'd expect prayer to be pretty high on that list, right? And it is. It's talked about 371 times in the Bible. What about love? Right? Love is a consistent topic from Genesis to Revelation. And love is talked about 714 times. But the topic of generosity is mentioned, get this, over 2,100 times in the Bible. It's pretty crazy, right? The Bible talks about giving or our possessions three times more than it talks about love. So what does that tell us then? Well, it tells us a couple of things. First and foremost, it tells us that our God is a generous God. We serve a God who loves to give. He loves to bless his children. Right from the very beginning, right, he put Adam and Eve into a paradise that he created out of generosity specifically for them. Right, then even after the fall, even after they rejected his generosity, he continued to pursue them out of his generous heart, and eventually he gave everything for us. Right? Nowhere in Scripture do we see this more clearly than in John 3, 16, which says, For God so loved the world that he what? He gave, his only son. he gave. He gave his only son. Our God is a generous God. Now, the other thing that those 2,100 mentions tell us is that giving is important to God. Giving is important to God. I need you to hear this because it reveals our heart to him and it reflects his heart to the world. Giving reveals our heart to him and it reflects our heart to the world. I want you to pause for just a moment to think about this, that giving is an expression of the love that you have for Jesus. Giving is an expression of the love that you have for Jesus. I'm not sure if some of you have seen it this way before, but if you've been with us on Sunday mornings, you hear me say when we give through our time of giving, right, that giving is a form of worship because it's an expression of our love for Jesus. In fact, any expression of our love for Jesus is worship, right? Worship is not limited to just singing because worship refers to the posture of our heart. Just like when we lift our voices, right, and we raise our hands, singing his praises, the act of giving demonstrates our love for Jesus, right, in that it reveals the posture of our heart and our love for him. So let me put it to you this way. When I was dating Lindsay, I expressed my love for her in a few different ways, right? I told her that I loved her, of course, but I also showed her by giving to her. I mean, I'd been making a bunch of money at the time, but what I have, I wanted to give, and I wanted to shower her with gifts to show her that I loved her. 
And some of you have heard this now infamous story that after just a few dates, I actually bought her an annual pass to Disneyland. <laughs> that was no like, you know, small or short-term investment there. It was actually kind of a, a risky way to show her my love. But I know I'm not alone here. I know some of you have done those same sorts of things because when we love somebody so much, we give so passionately. We give because it's an expression of our love. So let me ask you this morning, church, does your giving reflect your love for Jesus? Does your giving reflect your love for Jesus? Are you, are you worshiping God through your giving? And if you were here with us a couple of weeks ago, Pastor Dan gave this message where he had us pull out our phones, and he had us look at how much time we're spending on social media apps, comparing ourselves to one another. If you were here, you know that's a convicting point. I realized where I was finding my value, where I was finding my worth. But if I were to ask you to, ask, to pull up the app for your financial institution, what would your bank account say that you worship? It just got real. <laughs> Is your giving an accurate expression of the love that you have for Jesus? Would your account show that you're worshiping him with your treasure, or would your account show that you're worshiping someone else, something else? I mean, have any of you ever considered letting somebody else see inside your bank account, taking some accountability there? I know you think I'm crazy, but we look for accountability in every other area of our life except for here. That pit that some of you might be feeling in your stomach right now means you might need some accountability. But what about your time? What about your talents? When we talk about generosity and giving abundantly, we need to remember that God didn't just give us finances. He's blessed us with far more than just our finances. So are you giving of your time and of your talent in a manner that reflects God's heart for the world? Man, I can't help but wonder, right, what our world would look like if giving actually reflected the love that we have for Jesus. I wonder how many people would be more open to hearing and receiving the gospel, right, if they witness our worship in the way that we give. Because they'll come here and they'll see us lifting our hands and they'll see us go and ignore the people that need our help. I can't help but wonder if the impact Awakened Church would have on Round Rock, on Austin, on the state of Texas, if we worshiped in our giving the way we do in our singing, if we opened our hands right as freely as we raised them. Well, I'll tell you what will happen. We'll start to see God being generous, not just to us, but through us. We'll start to experience the beauty of his generosity, and that the more we give, the more we receive. And all of a sudden, our focus becomes less on wealth accumulation and on heaven population. Right? When we open up ourselves to be used by God in this way, we unlock the true gift of generosity, and we discover that there's treasures that we never even knew existed. So this morning, I'm not going to ask you to open up your wallet. Don't worry, this isn't some sort of you know, building campaign. What I want you to do is to open up your hearts to hear what God might have to say to you today in this area that you tend to keep hidden, that you tend to keep closed. Would you loosen your grip on whatever it is that you might be holding on to and consider for just a moment that God might be asking you to give that over to him in worship? Would you pray with me? Father, we bow before you this morning, God, with grateful hearts. Father, your word says that you are willing and able to do exceedingly and abundantly more than we could ever ask or imagine. And Father, I just thank you for the ways you have been faithful to that promise in my life and God in your church. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would move in the hearts of your people this morning. Would you stir them up, Spirit, as you invite them to play an active role in your generosity to the world. Lord, we lay our lives at your feet this morning and ask that you would move in our hearts. We pray all of this, of course, in Jesus' name. Amen. And well, if you have your Bibles or your Bible apps, I want to ask you to open up to Proverbs chapter 11 this morning. We're going to take a look at the wise words of King Solomon as he shared some God-given wisdom on this idea of generosity. I just want to point out quickly, we talked about Solomon, how he was one of the wisest men to ever walk the earth, but he was also one of the richest. In fact, I looked this up. If you translated his wealth into today's money, he'd be worth about $2 trillion dollars. Crazy, right? Not even our newest neighbor, Elon Musk, could sniff that kind of wealth. You'd actually have to take the top 400 richest Americans to even come close to King Solomon's wealth. So this is a guy who clearly knew a thing or two about money and about generosity. 
So with that in mind, would you join me in Proverbs chapter 11? We're looking at just two verses today, verses 24 and 25. It reads, one gives freely, yet grows all the richer. Another withholds what he should give and only suffers want. Whoever brings blessing will be enriched, and the one who waters will himself be watered. Now, at first glance, some of these proverbs, they sound a little bit more like riddles, if we're being honest, right? Like, how am I supposed to be able to give freely but yet grow richer at the same time, right? My son's into Star Wars, so some of this sounds a little bit more like Yoda than Solomon, right? <laughs> these two things shouldn't be able to uh, coexist, right? I shouldn't be able to give freely yet grow richer, but God says, yes, that's exactly the point. That's the paradox of generosity, right? That on the surface, it seems like nonsense because our world doesn't operate this way. Right? We live in like a zero-sum kind of world that says, if I give you $100, that means I lost $100. If I give you something, that means I must have lost something. But God's economy doesn't work that way. In God's economy, when we give, we also receive. When we're generous, we don't lose. We actually gain. We receive something in return. Let me say not just something, but the very things that money can't buy, things like happiness, things like purpose you see that that second part of the verse that the withholding leads to want it's not that withholding what you have leads to wanting more things sure it could do that but withholding leads to wanting those things that money can't buy how many times have you heard these rich and famous people talk about how lonely they are because in our selfishness we find it necessary to hold on to the things that we think are going to make us happy and then when they don't make us happy, we just try to acquire more of it, when in reality, the only way that we're going to find that happiness is by giving away those very things we thought were going to make us happy. Are you seeing this paradox of generosity? See, in God's economy, it inspires us to see the entire world differently. It's a complete paradigm shift when we view our time and our talents and our treasures as po- not, not as possessions to be lost, but as gifts to be given. Let me tell you, friends, those gifts Come with a reward that is guaranteed. I'm not saying that God's going to fill up your bank account if you give money. That's the prosperity gospel. That is a false gospel. If any of you ever hear that there is a pastor saying, hey, if you sacrifice financially, God's going to fill your bank account. If you give to our our building campaign, you're going to be able to get that vote later on down the line. God wants to bless you. That is false gospel, friends. God's not in the business of giving you all of your heart's desires. God's in the business of aligning your desires with his desires. There's a verse, I don't even know the reference point right now, that says God wants to give you your heart's desires. But we leave out the first part, saying that he wants to align our desires with his desires. And then he will give you your heart's desires because they're his desires. So value the giver above the gift, my friend. So if verse 24 then isn't talking about us becoming literally richer, what is it trying to teach us? All right, well, in order for us to better understand this, I actually want to look to the New King James Version. Normally we use the, the ESV. We're going to go to the New King James Version this morning and look at verse 24. It gets us a little bit closer to the context of, of the original language here. It says, there is one who scatters, yet increases more. And there is one who withholds more than is right, but it leads to poverty. You see, when the book of Proverbs was written, it was written to a mostly like agrarian society. So there's recent translations that we have that talk a little bit more about giving. They lead us to think that this is about financial wealth. But that's not what it's saying here. The context has more to do with farming and with crops. So the metaphor is that a farmer who scatters lots of seeds will produce a larger harvest, a more bountiful harvest. And if you scatter less seed, well, you're going to see less of a result. So think about it for a moment. I've got this cup here. This cup is filled with seeds. These seeds represent your time and your talents and your treasure, right? And so what happens when you give only when you're guilted into it, right? Oh, man, that, that commercial, those people need a little bit of my money, right? Oh, oh, pastor preached a convicting message. I've got five bucks in my pocket. I should probably, probably give that. You don't have to be a farmer to know that that's not going to produce much of a harvest, right? But what happens when you give freely, right? When you give generously and boldly the way that God calls us to, imagine the harvest, friends. Imagine what God will produce. The verse says that we're supposed to scatter boldly and generously, pouring out our lives. 
worship team's going to kill me for this. <laughs> you see, the paradox of generosity doesn't guarantee we will double our financial investment. It guarantees if we live bold and generous lives for the sake of others, we will be rich in relationships. We'll be rich by the way we find purpose in seeing God move in the lives of others. The paradox of generosity, friends, it tells us that if you give, you gain, and if you hold, you lose. And in case you don't believe me this morning, actually, there's secular research that supports this too. Several universities have studied this topic of generosity, and they have all found that giving not only improves the lives of those that are receiving of your gift, but it improves your very own life as well. These studies have shown that those who are generous are happier, their marriages are stronger, and they even live longer on average than those who are not generous. But friends, this paradox of generosity, it's a spiritual truth, right? It's a gift from God, but it's also scientifically proven that one gives freely, yet grows all the richer. Another withholds what he should give and only suffers want. So give freely, my friends. Because here's the thing, generosity didn't start with us. Right, we've all received something. Generosity didn't start with us, so it's not to end with us either. God's generosity is meant to be given through us. Look at verse 25. It says, whoever brings blessing will be enriched, and one who waters will himself be watered. I'm going to look one more time to the New King James Version here because it says it plainly that the generous soul will be made rich. So again, Solomon takes us back to this idea of farming, right? This idea that when a plant is watered, it's receiving what it needs to grow and to prosper. Only this time there's a twist, right? Because it says that in order for us to be watered, in order for our soul to be enriched, we must be watering others. Right? We live a, a poured out life and give of our time and our talents and our treasure. God is faithful to pour into us. Some of you have seen this in your own lives through the form of discipleship. Somebody pours into you, and then you're able to pour into somebody else. And there's fruit, and there's growth all around. But what happens to us when we're not pouring out? What happens to us when all we're doing is receiving, and we're not generous? What happens when we become the end of God's generosity? Well, we become kind of like the Dead Sea, right? When we allow God's generosity to end with us, we end up like the Dead Sea, which receives fresh water, right? The, the Jordan River flows into the Dead Sea. Fresh water flows into the Dead Sea, but there's no outlet. So what happens to that fresh water is that it becomes salty, incredibly salty, so that nothing could live in it. And because the Dead Sea has no outlet, it's also constantly shrinking. I found out that over 7 million tons of water are evaporating from the Dead Sea every single day. So church, listen, when all you are doing is taking in when you're not, all you're doing is taking in and there's no giving away, you are slowly dying. And I feel like somebody in the room needs to hear that indecision is also still a decision. The word says we're to give boldly and generously and cheerfully. It doesn't say that we're supposed to wait until it's comfortable for us to give. True generosity is sacrificing our comfort for the sake of others. So don't wait, friends, because God's generosity is meant to flow through you. When you choose to only receive, you not only rob God, you're also harming yourself in the process. I realize some of you may have heard that analogy before, but here's a, a surprise ending for you. Not only is nothing able to survive in the Dead Sea, but its lack of generosity, its lack of an outlet is bringing destruction to everything around it. So check this out. The, the Dead Sea is obviously salt water, but around it, what you can't see are there are pockets of fresh water. And those pockets of fresh water are being killed by the Dead Sea. And so that water that's under the surface is dissolving and the earth above it is giving way. There are over a thousand sinkholes that have appeared in the last 15 years around the Dead Sea that are swallowing up buildings and roads and trees. This is a destruction that we can't see. In the lives of those around us, when we are not living generous lives, not only are we receding, not only are we shrinking, not only are we slowly dying, but we are having an impact on the lives of those around us. The simple but hard truth, friends, is that if you're not giving as you receive, you're not just hurting yourself, you're harming those around you. So let me talk to those of you with kids. 
Have you ever considered the ways that you are modeling or not modeling generosity for them? Right? If you allow God's generosity to flow through you, those receiving your generosity aren't the only ones that are going to benefit. In fact, those university studies I was talking about earlier, one of them showed that just people just witnessing generosity, right, being a, a, a third party, a bystander to generosity, it's still having a dramatic impact on their lives. Your kids and those around you will benefit from your generosity. So parents, let's get practical here. How can we model generosity to our kids? We are not perfect parents, but we've seen this in our kids because we end up, we sponsor kids. Right? So knowing the name of a child living in poverty has had a dramatic impact on my son Caleb's life. I can say definitively it has made him a more generous kid. There are simple ways for you to model this generosity for your kids. Let me tell you, when you do it with joy, they find joy in it too. There's also tangible ways to, to, to model God's generosity to them. When I was little, I remember there was one, one Christmas where my dad gave me, I think it was like a $5 bill. And he told me to go buy a present for my mom. And he gave me so much joy to use money that wasn't mine in the first place to bless somebody else. I still remember giving her that gift. I was in kindergarten. 30 years later, she still has that gift. And it was such a simple lesson. Right? It cost my dad five bucks. But it painted this tangible picture for me of God's generous heart to give through me. And as a kid, I never once thought about keeping that $5. I was just so happy to give my mom a present, to show her that she was loved. But yet as adults, we tend to hold on to that. We tend to hold on to what God has given us, even though he's intended to give through us. Out of fear, out of laziness, we choose to be the end of God's generosity and to keep those blessings for ourselves, friends. I need you to see that there's a flip side to this paradox of generosity. That while giving leads to gain, greed leads to pain. Proverbs 15, 27 tells us that the greedy bring ruin to their households. Giving leads to gain, but greed leads to pain, my friends. And in the end, if we don't allow God's generosity to flow through us, we become like the Dead Sea, slowly ruining ourselves and those around us. Friends, I know this is convicting, but I want you to know that there is hope. See, the Dead Sea could teem with life again if it just had an outlet, if it just allowed water to flow through. That may not happen for the Dead Sea, but it can still happen for you. You can still experience the newness of life if you allow God's generosity to flow through you. Friends, let me remind you that we serve a generous God who longs to be generous through you. And there's something special that happens when you allow God to be generous through you. Something incredible. Listen to this. When you recognize how generous God has been to you, and you open yourself up and allow him to be generous through you, your eyes will be open to the needs of those around you. And most of you already know this, but in addition to serving as your lead pastor here at Awaken, I also work for a nonprofit called World Vision. We do development work around the world in these third world countries. And one of the biggest blessings I have in that role is to walk with donors and to shepherd them through this process. Most of them are, are very much aware that God has been generous to them. Their bank account reflects that. But what happens when they open themselves up and allow God to work through them, all of a sudden their eyes are open. It's like a veil is lifted, and they start to see the need of generosity all around them. All of a sudden they're downsizing their homes, they're rewriting their wills, they're selling off businesses, all to give to people they have never met in a place they have never been to. And it's in the midst, friends, of that radical generosity that kind that truly costs you something, that God works miracles. When our generosity, you see, lines up with him, when we're obedient to engage those he has called us to, we see God moving in ways we never imagined. Right, we see this in the early church, right? In the book of Acts, we all kind of know this story that each believer gave whatever they had need. Right, we know this reference, and at the end of Acts chapter 2, we see that signs and wonders are being done after Peter preaches at Pentecost. Right, we tend to think that this generosity was just a response to those amazing signs and wonders. That it was some sort of, maybe even like just like an aftershock to the earthquake. But it was in those very moments of generosity where the Holy Spirit shook the foundation of the earth. 
You see, that kind of radical giving didn't exist before then. This wasn't just a response to the movement of the Holy Spirit. This was a move of God itself. Friends, when we minimize generosity to simply a response to something, we are missing out on miracles. We are missing out on a move of God. Family, I believe there are miracles in this room that are waiting to happen if we would just allow God to give through us. If we would just give ourselves away, there are miracles right here in this room. Church, we're not to be the end of God's generosity. He has been generous to us in order that we might share it with others. He's worked miracles in our lives in order that we might be a part of the miracles in others' lives. But in order for that to happen, we have to allow his generosity to flow through us to reach those that he is calling us to. The fact is, we live in a world that is living with this scarcity mindset. There's only one way for us to reach them. And it's by introducing them to a generous God. And friends, the most effective way we can do that is by giving to them. By putting their needs before ours. And when we do that, friends, we will find that there is treasure to be found in giving. So as I invite the band back up, I want to share with you this parable to help illustrate this point. This parable of this man having a conversation with God, and one day he says, God, I want to know what heaven and hell are like. So God takes this man, and he shows him two doors. Inside the first one, in the middle of the room, there's a large round table with a large pot of vegetable stew. That stew smelled delicious. It made the man's mouth water, but the people sitting around the table were thin and sickly. They appeared to be famished. They were holding these spoons with these really long handles, and each of them found it possible to reach into that pot of stew and to get some soup. But the handles were longer than their arms, so they couldn't get them back to their mouths. And the man, he shuddered at the sight of their misery and their suffering. And God told him, you have seen hell. But then they looked behind the second door in the, the room. It appeared exactly the same. There was this large round table with a large pot of vegetable stew that made that man's mouth water. The people had the same long-handled spoons, but they were well-nourished. They were plump. They were laughing. They were happy. The man says, God, I don't understand. And God smiled. He said, it's simple. Love only requires one skill. You see, these people learned early on to share with one another while the greedy only think of themselves. One gives freely, yet grows all the richer. Another withholds what he should give and only suffers long. Church, God designed us to be generous. He has blessed us beyond what we deserve. And he has opened our eyes to the needs of those around us. My question for you this morning, church, is how will you respond? Will you continue to just give out of a place of scarcity? Will you continue just to give out of guilt? Or will you give generously? Answer God's call to boldly give your life away. The Lord has blessed you so richly, and right now, those very things He's blessed you with your time, your talents, your treasure you've got it in your mind. Those things stand between you and Jesus, and you have a decision to make. Are you going to choose the gifts, or are you going to choose the gift giver? Choose Jesus, friends. Choose the gift giver. Ask him to show you where to give of your time and your talents and your treasures, and he will be faithful to show up. He will be faithful to work miracles through your giving and have an impact on the kingdom. Now, if you're here this morning, we're not just about inspiring you. I also want to give you some practical steps to take. I'm going to give you some practical outlets through which you can give. Let's start with the giving of your time. You can start by doing that this week, and you, we actually have opportunities for you right here at Awaken. And if you ask anybody on our team, they will tell you that serving adds so much to their Sunday. I took that one from my buddy Dom Bentley. Whether you show up early to set up and tear down or if you're giving by greeting people on our connections team, you will find that as you pour out, God continues to pour in to you. In fact, I've heard several of you talk about loving serving in kids ministry because of the way that the gospel all of a sudden starts to jump off of the page. Let me tell you, friends, the word of God didn't change. It's the word of God flowing through you that's having the impact. 
friends, if you need an outlet, giving of your time is a great place to start, but don't stop there because generosity isn't about just meeting some quota. So give of your talents as well. What skills has God blessed you with? Yeah, there's opportunities for that here at Awaken as well, but what about in your own neighborhood? We have guys here who literally have nothing but a toolbox and a heart for those around them that are creating a huge impact for the kingdom. And you too have skills that God has given you. You can use those to glorify him. And of course, friends, I have to close with what's nearest and dearest to your heart. There is no shortage of outlets to give of your treasure. God has done miraculous things right here at Awaken. We've seen marriages restored. Lives transformed. We've seen families reunited as a result of your giving. And it goes beyond this family. It goes beyond these four walls because we have continually given over 10% into the community to church plants, to missionaries, to nonprofits that are having an impact on the kingdom in Jesus' name. So you can sacrifice your time, you can sacrifice your talents, but don't let your treasure get between you and Jesus. Give your treasure boldly. Give it radically as an expression of your love for Jesus. May it reveal your heart to him and may it reflect his heart to the world. Father, we bow before you this morning. God, we are in awe of who you are. You are a good and a generous father. Lord, I know you are going to work miracles in this room through the generous hearts of your people. So, Father, would you instill in us your courage, your boldness, and your spirit so that we might give of that which you have given to us. Lord, would our lives reflect your love to those around us. Would you use us to do your mighty works? Father, we give it all to you. In Jesus' name, amen. So I'll stand and worship with us. May his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children. May his presence go before you and behind you and beside you and around you and within you. He is with you. What's time to sing it? you to know if you were convicted this morning know that there is grace know that it is never too late for you to start living a generous life we'd love to talk to you. you can find anybody on our team if you want to find out more about giving in any way your time talents or treasures we would love to help you do that whether it's here at awaken or somewhere else use your life use what god has given you to make an impact on the kingdom
Man, I can't wait to see y'all next Sunday. Can't wait to see you fellas here this afternoon at 430. Not, not going to lie, I'm pretty good at cornhole, so throwing down the gauntlet. Whoever wants a piece of this, come and get it. Have a great week, guys. See you next Sunday.